But if the original creation was good, and indeed it says very good, it was, it seems, incomplete, because creation in Genesis chapters 1 and 2 seems to be not a tableau, but a project. It's not just that God makes something which sits there like a picture, like a model that you might see in a storefront window, which people just admire as it is, but it's a project, it's going somewhere. And so the humans who are created at the heart of the project, I'll come back to that in a moment, they have a job to do. What God is doing is launching something, something which is going somewhere. And though this is very mysterious, it looks when we put the whole thing together, as though Genesis is telling us about what happens, who knows how many millennia after the original Big Bang, as we now think of it as, when God calls a human pair and says, I have a special job for you to do. I want you to make this world into a lovely, glorious place. I want you to look after it on my behalf. And I want it to be a place where heaven and earth come together, where you as the human pair, as those who are going to produce more humans, you will be the people through whom creation as a whole will celebrate and worship the creator. And so humans are created in the divine image. This is so important. Humans are not just a little bit that's broken off when God finished doing something else. Humans are not uh, an accident, a sort of a cosmic freak that just happened like this. One of the main things that Genesis 1 is teaching us is that humans have a very special, unique place within the entire design and narrative of creation. Genesis talks about this in terms of the image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. And he said then, be fruitful and multiply. He blessed them and said, fill the earth, subdue it, have dominion over the fish of the sea, the birds of the air, and over every living thing that moves upon the earth. This is a vocation. Many theologians have puzzled about what it might mean to say that humans are made in the image of God. Many have suggested that perhaps it's something to do with the human mind or imagination or will or memory or something like that, something which we've got which makes us a little bit like God, so that when God looks at us, he sees a sort of bit of himself at least reflected in a mirror. That's not the point of the language of the image. If you start with the idea of an ancient temple, then from that temple, you can say, well, what's missing in this temple? Every ancient temple, except the Jewish temple, had an image in it, an image of the God, so that the worshippers who came in could see who the God was and could offer the God or the goddess their worship and sacrifices and so on. And so that the presence of that God would somehow be vested in this statue, this image, this uh, portrait, so that people would sense the power and majesty and awesomeness of the God when they were faced with the image. So God makes heaven and earth as a temple, and he puts into this temple an image of himself so that creation around can appropriately worship him through that image, and so that the uh, power and love and stewardship and sovereignty of God can be exercised in the world, again, through the image. In other words, it isn't that the image is a mirror in which God is reflected back to God. The image is an angled mirror through which the worship of creation is reflected up to God and the stewardship and love and purposes of God are reflected out into the world. So humans as image goes with creation as temple, goes with creation as good, as designed to be a good world, a united world, an integrated world, with humans at the focal point of that integration.